Hey guys, this is Pastor Geek talking to you, giving you a little bit of an update. Actually have the book, uh, the text of the book done. Uh, now we're just working on uh, six appendices. So the way we've gone about this is um, Paul and I go to the library and we spend eight hours or so um, doing sort of research. He, his job is to kind of go out there and locate what I need to read and, and he's really good at this, kind of just getting a sense of the kind of main things I gotta read to, to uh, you know, be up on my subject and cover my bases and respond to objections and prove my case and all that kind of stuff. And he'll bring it back to me and uh, then I will read it. And so uh, we're almost done. Uh, I think we're done with the library stuff. Uh, now, this last time through, these are some of the books that I have uh, gotten that I need to get through. Uh, we got Old Testament Theology by Brueggemann, and, and we've got Did God Really Command Genocide uh, by Paul Copen and this guy named Flanagan. And uh, here's uh, Old Testament Theology by Walter Brueggemann, and so on and so on and so on. And um, on top of that, now these are, are some of the uh, Xerox essays, Paul's Xerox uh, essays and journals and articles that I need to read. And so th these are a sampling of, of the articles that I've uh, read already. These are done. Uh, these are notebook uh, notes that I've taken on various articles and books. I mean, a couple thousand books I've read for, the, for this thing. And um, here's some more of these essays. And the only ones I have to remaining now are these. These are the ones we got this last Friday. And so I have to read through these and I read through these and then I implement them into the appendices and finish up the footnotes and voila, we're done. We've got 400, roughly uh, of a 1200 page book, 400, about a third of it is footnotes. Uh, so this is not gonna be, you know, kind of your easy reading stuff. It's a little, little bit academic, but I will have a popular version uh, that will come uh, shortly after that. So there's the update. I want you to know what we're doing. Uh, there's also a lot of networking going on. I'll tell you more about that in, in next week, uh, but we're shaping this rising revolution and it's exciting. And actually this is stuff, some of you would think this is torture, but this is my sweet spot. I love doing this stuff. Read, 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 digest, pour into it. All right, God bless you guys. Have a great service. See you later. We've been blessed for actually years to have this next guy with us uh, here in Minnesota. He moved here uh, from Michigan? Where'd you move from? Chicago, that's right. He lived in Michigan before. He's been all over. He lived in California, Michigan, New Mexico, Chicago. Uh, Seth McCoy, help, help me welcome him up to the stage, would you? <laughs> Seth McCoy from the mean streets of Pasadena. That's where he was, he was, uh, he was born. This guy actually used to be my boss here at Woodland. Now he's not my boss. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, he is the boss. So uh, help me uh, pray for him, would you? Father God, um, I just think of, I, just, I think of people in the Bible like, like David and Paul and Moses and these people who you took on this journey and we, we, we are blessed to read about their journeys and the things that you have done in their lives and the, the wisdom that we can learn from in those stories. And Lord, you do that with all of us. We are all on a journey with you. Our life is, uh, we, we, we move through life hoping to always have your presence, always have your wisdom. And um, Lord, just like with those people, uh, Seth has also been steered through his life through these different places. And Lord, we can learn from his wisdom. Lord, we can learn from his humility. And um, Lord, just the different places that you've taken him. So God, we just uh, ask you to continue to have your hand on him today as he teaches to us. And Lord, it's just like uh, th that song that we sang that uh, when we are at our weakest, your power is completed. And so Lord, we ask you to humble Seth and humble us to receive your word and have your power completed in us this morning. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Thanks, Trevor. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna be with you uh, for the next two weeks uh, teaching a very short series uh, called Wholehearted. Um, ever since the beginning of the church, what God has been calling people to is to have filled hearts and to give their whole selves. And that's a little what I want to talk about for the next two weeks. So it's going to be a pleasure to be with you today uh, and a pleasure to be with you again, uh, again next week. Um, last year, my, my parents sent me a care package uh, from California. And uh, in this care package, I, I wasn't sure what it was. I didn't get any advance notice from my folks. So I opened it up. And there was all this uh, memorabilia from when I was younger, when I was a kid. Um, there was a baseball that was signed by all my teammates um, from the last place Orioles team that I played on in Little League. We were terrible. Um, there were like pictures of like 
girls I forgot that I took to the prom or the homecoming, and I, I, I saw some of those photos. There were cards that I got. Um, there was a little old Steve Garvey doll. He was a player for the Los Angeles Dodgers, which is my favorite team. I slept with that little guy all the time. Um, and then there were some other things that were from uh, the, the few years just after I got adopted. Things that happened so early on in my life that I had kind of forgotten about them, and they sort of like just brought up these, uh, some of these memories from, from the back of my mind. Um, one of them... Uh, was um, when I was younger, I, uh, I, I wasn't able to join the Cub Scouts. I think that my brother was in the Cub Scouts, and I think he was a little better at stuff than I was. So I got like the JV version of the Cub Scouts, which the YMCA ran. Um, the YMCA was fascinated for a little while in the 70s with Native American kind of things. So uh, I, was in, I was in this little Cub Scout program, and me and my dad made this kite. So we, we were a little team. Um, he was Brave Eagle, and I was Shooting Star. I'm pretty sure because I was always shooting my mouth off. I think that's why my dad named me that one. So, um, Now, this is a historic kite right here. This is, um, as you can see, the kind of artistic talent it took, first of all, to create it. Um, second, the technological and aerodynamic design of this has just not been repeated since we created this masterpiece. Um, this thing was dreamed up, designed, and built by the McCoy family in California. Um, the thing that's the most special about this thing to me um, is that me and my dad built it together. And we built it together, and on a beautiful uh, Saturday morning in Pasadena, California, this, this thing actually flew. Now, um, besides this being the best kite that's ever been built and created, it's not the most beautiful thing that's ever been built and created. In order to get to that, you have to actually go back for uh, a little ways um, to the most incredible builder that the human race has ever known. It makes a ton of sense that his job, his trade, was a carpenter because carpenters know how to build things. They know how to build things that last. Ever since the beginning... God doesn't build things on his own, but loves to build them together. Uh, let's look at this verse from Matthew chapter 18. Jesus talks about what it is that he wants to build. Uh, Matthew 16, verse 18, he says, Now I'm going to tell you who you are, who you really are. You're Peter, a rock. And this is the rock on which I will put together, on which I will build my church. A church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. Now, um, Peter's name wasn't Peter when Jesus first met him. His name was Simon, son of John. Now, John, uh, his dad, uh, was a fisherman. And so when Jesus called Peter uh, uh, Simon, son of John, he meant Simon, the one who fishes. Now, Simon, uh, Simon Peter is a character that I identify with. And, and maybe you know a few stories about this guy. Um, this is the guy who, when the storm was raging and all the other disciples were in a boat, he's the guy who had enough guts to say, Jesus, I want to do that too. Uh, the other 11 stayed in the boat. And Peter was bold enough to step out of it. And at least for a few steps, to be the only other one besides Jesus that walked on water. Uh, he's also the only disciple to be called Satan by Jesus. So it wasn't all good for Peter. Jesus uh, changes his name, and he says, Simon, you're not just son of John. You're not just a fisherman anymore. Um, actually, I'm going to make you a person who, not, who doesn't fish for fish, but someone who fishes for men. You have important work to do, Peter. Uh, and his name, Peter, actually means rock. Other thing that stands out from this part of Matthew is uh, Jesus' determination on how strong this church will be. It will be so strong and so beautiful that even though the gates of hell will focus all their energies on destroying it, they will be unable to. See, the thing about Jesus is Jesus loves his church. He loves it. When he has to think of a metaphor to try to give for it, he's trying to figure out how, how can I communicate about this in a way that helps people understand how much I love it. The metaphor that he uses to describe it, he calls it his bride. How much do you love a bride? How much do you love your bride? When do you stop loving your bride? Jesus is still building that church. 
not just on Peter the rock anymore, but on many, many rocks and stones that Jesus has been putting together, the most beautiful thing that he's created. Now, a few years ago, I got caught up in what is now known as binge watching. Now, I had my experience in like binge ice cream eating. We talked about that a little while ago. Um, but there's this thing now called binge watching TV. Now, it used to be in the 90s, um, when I was maybe at my peak, uh, I loved watching TV shows like Seinfeld. That was one of my favorites. I've heard that people liked watching Friends. I never understood why, but some people did like it. So like an, a show like Seinfeld or Friends, um, you would watch the TV show. You'd, you'd be enjoying it. You loved it, right? You loved these characters, and you wanted to spend time with them using the television. And you'd get to the end of an episode, and you would know as the timer is ticking down and your show is almost over, once that show's over, you're going to have to wait seven whole days to get more. Do you know I have good news for you? You don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> what I found out is using some kind of streaming service like Netflix or Hulu, that painful twinge that you feel at the end of an episode, that longing that you have, you can actually fulfill it and just move on and watch the next one. So a few years ago, I found a TV show that was so captivating to me that it introduced me to binge watching. Um, uh, I was binge watching the show and I totally loved it. The music was mysterious and moving. The setting was interesting to me. The characters resonated with me, especially the main character. The main character was my uh, twin brother that we were separated from birth. He admired me. I admired him. We wanted to be like each other. We were good friends. Um, every once in a while in my real life when I wasn't binge watching, when I was like with my family or working on something, I sometimes would come up upon a challenge that I couldn't figure out what to do, and I would like close my eyes and imagine what would Coach Taylor do right now? <laughs> now, the sad part about this show that I loved, and actually the part that I had to hide in shame for the first little while while I was binge watching, is that this show is a teenage drama, and I'm clearly not a teen. It took place in, uh, in the great state of Texas. Any podcasters that are listening to this, this is your chance to cheer for yourselves. People from Texas love to say they're from Texas, right? So uh, this, it, was a, it was a show about high school football in Texas. You all know the show is called Friday Night Lights, right? Now, I'm a sucker for melodramatic sports movies. There literally is nothing that moves me the same way that a rousing speech from a coach does. Like, do um, you remember the hockey movie Miracle? I cried like a baby through most of that movie, let alone remember the Titans. Um, I was an emotional basket case. You know, when that coach pulls the team together and he says, not one more yard, you make this team, make them never forget the night they played the Titans. I was like, it was a, it was a mess. I was snot, I was crying, I was moved. So this Coach Taylor uh, in Friday Night Lights, some of my favorite moments is when he'd be in the locker room trying to talk to these young guys about giving their best. There literally is almost nothing that motivates me as much as someone who will look me in the eyes and ask me the question, is, is this your best? And so he would get the team together, and he had this little mantra where he would say something, and then they would respond with it. And it's stuck in my head. Uh, he would say, clear eyes and full hearts, and then what would the team say back? Those of you who know the show, can't lose. One or two of you, as nerdy as I am, and love that show. <laughs> I feel for you. We're together there. <laughs> Clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. Now, in the church's history, there is a time period of the church that's recorded in Scripture that has captivated every generation that has ever read about it. It was a time when Jesus' people were so filled with his spirit that their eyes were crystal clear and their hearts were overflowing and they weren't losing. Let's take a look at this. It's in the book of Acts. You probably knew we were going to go there. Here's what it says, Acts chapter 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. That sounds like a small miracle, doesn't it? All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They had so much unity that some of them sold property and possessions so that in their little community, there was no need. Every day they met together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, 
praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number every day those people who were being saved. I love the church. This picture that we get of the church has captivated me and it's captivated generation after generation to recapture this spirit that this little group of pioneers had. And I just have a couple questions for you about this. In Acts chapter 2, it said that they were devoted. I wonder, how, how devoted are you right now? If we just had to draw it on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being my heart is filled, 1 being I'm pretty depleted, where are you right now? What number would you assign yourself? How devoted are you? Honestly. With no judgment, how full is your heart these days? Would you say it's a 10? Would you say it's a 1, a 5, or a 7? Where are you? Our worship and prayer, those were strong parts of this early church that captured us. How strong a part of your life and your day are those things? With no judgment, what is fellowship, the breaking of bread? What does that look like for you these days? What is this idea of community? How, how is it that you're pursuing that? Is that a 10? Is that a 1? Is that a 4? Where, where are you really? At the end of that, it talked about people were added every single day. Where's that? How is that going for you? How are you doing at being a witness to what God is doing in your own life? A number of years ago, uh, when, I was a, uh, when I was a young pastor, uh, a rookie, wet behind the ears, really didn't know what I was doing, but certain that I did, uh, I had an older mentor who took me to a church conference. It was a really big church. It was the biggest church building I, I had ever seen. I grew up in a church about this size, which I thought was like ginormous. And I went and visited this church, and it was unbelievable to me how many people were there. It was a gathering of church leaders, and the pastor was literally, if Coach Taylor from Friday Night Lights could be a pastor, this was the pastor. And he gave an incredibly rousing halftime speech to the gathering of church leaders that were there. And some of the things that he said have been like a virus in my head and my heart since I first heard him about 12 years ago. Um, he got up and he said this phrase that's been stuck in my head ever since. He says, he said, the local church is the hope of the world. There is nothing like the local church when the local church is working right. He said, don't get me wrong. There are all kinds of deeply meaningful organizations in our world. Organizations that feed the poor, that care for the homeless, that educate children. These are all things that God loves and cares about. It's meaningful work for the human race to be doing these. He said, but there is only one organization in the world that can transform and change a human heart. There's just one. And he asked another question. He said, what is it that you imagine that Jesus is doing right now? And he kind of sort of, in a tongue-in-cheek, humorous way, he kind of gave us some different options. He said, you know, like, do you imagine that Jesus, I've heard there's a heck of an angelic choir up there. Do you imagine that Jesus is the choral director, helping break apart four-part harmonies, you know, recruiting a new electric guitarist into the band? Is that, is that what Jesus is currently doing? He's working with the choir? Is he helping the planets sort of spin and making sure that the universe stays together? He had an awfully hard job while he was here. Maybe he's taking like a long heavenly nap. Is that what Jesus is doing right now? And then emphatically he stepped out from behind this little podium and he just insisted. He said, no. The 24-7 focus of Jesus at all times right now, the thing that is in his heart, his devoted passion is the local church and to build it and to protect it from the gates of hell that are trying to prevail against it. That's the only thing that Jesus is focused on. How is it that Jesus renews and refreshes his bride generation after generation? This captivating picture that we get from the book of Acts. How is it that Jesus does this over and over again? So the truth is the matter that this, that still happens. The local church transforming human hearts happens all over the world. From here in St. Paul over to Switzerland from churches in Texas, churches that meet in pubs, uh, churches that meet in barns, all over the world, Jesus is building and refreshing his church. It's the one thing that he's focused on and that he cares about. 
this vision about the church stopped me dead in my tracks when this pastor was saying that. And I had to like come to some points of decision. Am I going to be devoted to the thing that Jesus loves and cares about? But how does this happen? It happens one, one rock at a time. Let's take a look at this book of uh, Romans. Here's what Paul says to the church in Rome, uh, chapter 12. He says, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God's given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as he's given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, does he say do it average? No, do it well. If your gift is to encourage others, do it. If it's giving, give the best that you can. If God's given you leadership ability, if God's given you leadership ability in the thing that Jesus loves, you got to take that seriously. If you have a gift of showing others kindness, you should do it. It's really a pretty brilliant plan that Jesus came up with with this church. How many of us in this room have gifts? Every single one. What an amazing grace. You've been given a gift. And we all have different ones. They're not all the same. Maybe they don't fit on that list. That list is kind of a summary. It's not exhaustive of every gift that there is. But the truth is you have one, and we belong to each other. And what happens when someone's not bringing their gift? We miss it. And what happens when someone has a gift and they're not bringing their best? Just pause for one second. What else deserves the best that you can give? This pastor of the church of Chicago, I swear he looked me dead in the eye and said, what else deserves your best? Now, a few years earlier when I was in high school, in the winter of 1989, a high school friend of mine, he convinced me to go to a youth group winter retreat in California. They have winter retreats there. It was 60. <laughs> now, I mostly went to winter camp um, because I was an exceptional young man, devoted to God. I was pure of heart. I was seeking a time of solitude and reflection. I wanted the Lord to reveal himself to me more than my other peers. I wanted to dig into the scriptures during long sermon sessions. No, I went because there was going to be girls there. <laughs> and I spent most of my time doing the kind of things that none of your kids in Echo do. I was generally making a nuisance of myself, pranking other cabins, but spending most of my time trying to find the thing that a you know, kid in high school at winter camp is most looking for, I was looking for winter love. At one of the sessions, another one of the cabins, we had this talent show, and apparently the best talent they could pull together was to line each other up on the stage and play the toothbrush game, where there's one cup with water and a toothbrush, the first kid brushes his teeth and spits it out in the cup, and then they go on further and further down the line. What does the last kid in this game do? He gave it his very best. And, he, and for like 15 seconds of notoriety, he was semi-famous at a winter camp in California. So after this terrible sketch, then the, the preacher gets up to preach. Now, this preacher was also a gospel singer. And so what would happen, it was kind of like, instead of a sermon, it was a little bit like a musical. I mean, you know what happens in a musical. People act out a scene, and then after the scene is acted out, then they all sing a song about what they just acted out in case you didn't get it, right? So like, I could help, they should hire me as a consultant because I could help make musicals half the time. Just cut out the music. Um, <laughs> So what he would do is he would preach a little while, and then he'd sing a song that was about what he just preached about. And most of the time, I was really not paying attention, and neither was most of the room. Uh, I found out that there was a common theme for a lot of us that were at the camp. Looking for love apparently was a popular choice for high school kids at this <laughs> snow camp. Um, now, I had been basically not paying attention for the entire weekend. But in the final session, something was different for me. I could tell at, as the preacher got towards the end, he, um, he started talking with more passion and with more commitment, more of a challenge. And for some reason with me, that, that always resonated. So I started paying more attention to what he said. And as he got to the end, he said something like this. It's, it's not exactly like this, but he said, um, God's always needed young people 
to step up. And he's always called young people to like step up and some of those young people he's called to change their career plans and to choose to go into full-time ministry. And this was a little bit of a problem for me because as I'm sitting there listening to him, he said, some of you know that God's calling you to it right now. And I had other plans for my life. Uh, I came from a family where my dad was a, a corporate attorney in Los Angeles. And that's the way that I imagined my life going. You know, in the same way that Simon was son of John the fisherman, I was going to be Seth, son of Tim the lawyer. That was in my blood. That was in my family. My dad got paid to argue with people and win. And I could argue better than my dad. So I figured I'd be pretty good at this career field. And I had some well-laid-out plans, pre-law and then on to law school and then on to smashing corporate attorney success. And this preacher was going to ruin it. And he just said, real simple, he said, what are you going to do? He said, some of you in this room right now know that God is tapping you on the shoulder and he's saying, will you help me build? And you got to say yes. Now, only recently have I really thought about this, that like, that, ser that sermon and that preacher and that whole snow camp, they had no idea. In a room full of people that were kind of tuned out, I... I, my whole trajectory of my life was changing in that moment. And I learned that day that Jesus took the first steps and then he said to me, it's, it's your move, Seth. It's your move and it matters what you choose. And I've had lots of other times since that moment that the spirits tapped me on the shoulder and said, Seth, I have an important role for you to play. I have meaningful work for you to do. Will you say yes? And I'm not the only one. If we could hear hundreds of stories in this room, probably very similarly, God tapped me on the shoulder and asked me to do something, but I had to say yes or no. And maybe right now, someone's being tapped on the shoulder. And I don't know what it is that God's calling you to do, but you do. This is the way that Jesus has been building his church from the very beginning. One rock at a time. One person just like you at a time. Saying, I've given you the ability to do something well. Will you do it? And will you do it to the best of your ability? Some of you in this room... Maybe even on the fence about following Jesus. About putting your hand in his hand and making the decision that you're going to let him be the leader and Lord of your life. I just want to challenge you. What's stopping you? I'll tell you from my perspective, if you say yes, you will never regret it. What's your gift? What's your work to do? What is God calling you to? Why would you say no? Why? Maybe you've been on the fence about this community thing happening at Woodland called Sojourners. Maybe you have this feeling that you're supposed to join, but you're hesitating. Why would you say no? Maybe it's serving as an echo leader with the youth, helping to, you know, help them not to drink the toothbrush game and helping them to, like, move on into God's calling for their life. Maybe echo needs you. Maybe there's a coworker that you know you're supposed to share some of your faith with and take the risk of having a conversation that moves beyond what you did for the weekend uh, and moves into a spiritual conversation. Maybe that's what God's calling you to. Would you say yes? Could be running the slides. It could be working on the sound. It could be getting behind a camera. Everybody has something to bring. Heroes Gate, a missions trip, the lift. I could literally just go on and on and list everything that there is to do here. But mainly what I want to say is the local church is the hope of the world. It's the only thing that Jesus' full-time focus is on building. And who does he need? He needs every one of us with clear eyes and full hearts. And I promise you that we can't lose. Now there's a picture that we get in the Bible about what happens at the end of life, at the end of this age, when God gets to sort out all the messes that we've made of our world and our towns and our own lives. 
And God takes that whole ball of yarn and unwinds it and sets the thing straight. There's lots of ideas and interpretations about how that happens. I'm not going to try to argue about the specifics of that. But in every one of those variations, there is a moment where each one of us stand on our own as individual people in front of Jesus. And there's a chance, there's a chance that the words that will come out of Jesus' mouth will be, good job. You, you did well. You didn't do perfect, but you gave your best. You were faithful. I gave you a gift, and you did good with it. And I can't tell you how motivating it is for me to get to the end of my life and have Jesus look in my eyes and say, you did a good job. To be able to look at Jesus and say, we... We were able to build something together, and it was beautiful. And I think the feeling I'll have is more gratifying than watching that beautifully designed kite that my dad and I made, that thing soar through the air in Pasadena, California. I think that it's going to pale in comparison. I think whatever you give to the kingdom, I think you won't ever regret. Uh, one of uh, the staff members at Woodland Hills, Danny, who works in the Emerging Generation team, he helped put together a little video to summarize some of these thoughts. And what I want to say is, during the video, what I would love to have happen is for you just to be real open. And say, like, if, if the Spirit's tapping you on the shoulder and telling you it's time for you to step out, would you be open to that? And then with everything I could beg you with, w- would you say yes? Because whether you say yes or no, I think sometimes around a church this big, you feel like it doesn't matter. And I just want to tell you, it totally does. Um, After the video, the worship team is going to come back up, but the first thing that happens after the video is taking the offering. And I would just say, if you have the gift of giving, give your best. You won't regret it. Mm -hmm.